Okay, here we are with one of my favorite people on the planet. Uh, I am so happy to introduce to you my conversations with working actors, friends, to John Lacey. Uh, John has been in the entertainment business for over 30 years. Uh, he's an actor, he's a writer, he's a director, he's got over 90 TV and film credits, and he's got a, he's starting to amass his writing and directing credits as well. He's been on shows like Snowfall, Nashville, Hell on Wheels, Grey's Anatomy, Criminal Minds, Bones. You might know him from Sons of Anarchy. He's got quite a following there. Uh, and you can catch him coming up uh, on American Horror Story, the first two episodes of 2021, where he goes. Season 10. When is it? Season 10 is, is Season the new 10. season coming out. He's in 10. Yeah. He's going, he's going toe to toe with Sarah Paulson. So this is going to be a whole yeah. lot of dang fun. She, she gets right in my face. It was pretty fun. Oh, I love it. John yeah. Lacey, welcome to Conversations. Thank with you, Josh. Thank you, brother. Great to see you, brother. Good to see you. How's everything out in Smell A? Oh, uh, you know, I'm in Santa Monica now, man. It doesn't smell so bad. It's, oh, uh, moving it's on. The, up. the ocean, the ocean breeze is is exactly uh, why so many people move to Southern California, and we miss Hello, you, man. Hi. We we miss you and Ash both. It's well, uh, thank you. Uh, it hasn't been the same since you left. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One thing I didn't uh, mention is that you're a, a remarkable coach. And Thank you. um, your philosophy is something that I kind of picked up and brought with me uh, to Atlanta when we moved. And we joke about Doherty Creative being uh, the Lacey Group East. Um, and it's, and it's not too far from the truth. Uh, so you I like that. Well, we, we, we owe it, owe it all to this guy. Amen. <laughs> right. It starts Amen. here for me. Uh, this, this gets me off the hook when, whenever I start patting myself on the back and feeling like I'm some kind of guru or one of these LA acting teacher know-it-alls that, you know, people should be bowing down to. I, I just, I just quote Meisner. I just go right to the page number and, and, and pull the words exactly from his book. And I know for a fact I'm, I've found a, a very user-friendly way to teach uh, the Meisner techniques. So that I, I am good at. But uh, I tip my hat to, to everything he, he left for us in that book. And I, I know you agree with most all of it. And we, we talk the talk, the same uh, actor dialogue and vocabulary. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I owe it all to him because yeah. he paved the way. He sure did. He sure did. Yep. I, I really, uh, so, so you and I were uh, going head to head for a lot of commercial parts. Yep. Um, and then we, we kind of knew each other peripherally and then saw each other across the room at 200 South. And we're like, I think today is the day we're going to connect. And we connected. Yep. It's been downhill ever yep. since for both of us. Well, I, I, came, I came over and grabbed you and said, Josh Doherty, man, you are on fire. You are... Uh you are the pitch man for so many products on TV. And that means you're a hell of an actor. And that means that you have a way of connecting and storytelling that is really uh, on that next level, because you weren't just booking a lot of commercials. You were right out in front selling the product. And, you know, I, I've made 70% uh, of my income probably from TV commercials in 34 years. So I know the difference between just booking commercials and being locked in. And knowing what your type is and, and what your uh, what your storytelling essence is for the camera. And you hit that stride, man. So the conversation we had was, tell me about your film and TV career. And you said, not much to tell. <laughs> Flatline. And I said, well, you got you got to come and start studying with me because we got to we got to change that. Yeah. And you and trusted I, me and you trusted me. I did. I did. Yeah. And. And I trusted you because not only had I seen you around the audition rooms for so long, but uh, I had seen your work and I had seen the way you engage people and you were honest and real and there was no BS. There was, there was no self-aggrandizing actor talk. You were very, you were very blue collar and uh, very much about the work. And, and, and I really dig that. And I came to your class and learned so, so yep. much. And yep. you, you really, I think what a lot of folks don't understand is that when you start making your living as an actor, it can get very easy for it to just become the regular grind, especially yeah. doing commercial work. Uh, and it can get very easy for the work to become redundant and you kind of lose your passion for it. And 
you really helped ignite that reignite, I should say, that passion in me. And uh, you know, we just feed off each other and 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 do good. Yep. So well, I love hearing that. You know that, and and I saw it firsthand. And uh, that, I don't know, man. You haven't looked back. It's been a, it's been great watching it the last five six years. And you know, we've worked together on on my projects and and many other things. So yeah, yeah man. Yeah, I love the I love the path you're on now. It's it's the path you're meant to be on. Yeah. And um and the commercials are never going to not be there for you. But now you're really you know you're hitting your stride as a film and TV actor, and that's exciting. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a yeah. lot of fun. well. Your your work is soaring, man. So keep it up. Thanks. Who who thought I'd be hitting my stride with fifty five guest stars? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes and you gotta warm into it, right? <laughs> big time. That's that's it, man. It's 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 uh, it is a marathon, not a sprint. There's and there is this evolution that we're all going through as storytellers, and a big part of um, surviving as an actor. I would love to say just in Hollywood, but now, and not just because of pan, the pandemic, but really it's, there's so many places you can live now, so many zip codes you can live and be a part of this, this industry, which is really exciting. But the, the way to survive, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, tips that I give my actors on how to survive in terms of your sanity and uh, the gaps between work and whatnot. Uh, but a big part is self-awareness of why you're booking when you're booking. Mm. And why you're not suddenly booking. If there is suddenly a long, prolonged gap. I was very good at this somehow earlier in my career when I would have gaps in my booking. I could look at it and go, you know what's happening is I'm growing out of a character and I haven't kind of butterflied and had the chrysalis effect into the new character yet. Mm -hmm. And there, may, there might be an 18 month gap where I'm not as marketable because I haven't grown into my next type yet. And when actors don't have an eye on that and they think of themselves only as actors that should be malleable and be able to do just about anything. And what do you mean type? I hate those words. I don't like the thought of being a commodity or a brand. That's the bottom line is from a casting director's perspective is they need to be able to look at you and say, oh, you're that. And you also need to fit into these demographics of age brackets. And sometimes we just fall in between the cracks of being a little too young for this, a little too old for that. And then you grow into it suddenly and suddenly you're booking again. It's not that your luck changed. You grew into your next type. And I see it happening all the time with actors where I pull them aside in, in, a, in a waiting room and go, man, I, it's really fun to watch what's happening with you right now because it was so clear to me that you were heading towards something. And then I saw you grow into your next type. And now look, you've got you know, a dozen commercials on TV. And I saw you in a couple of guest stars and it doesn't surprise me at all. And they look at me as with the sense of what well, you've been tracking my career. You know, I just pay, I pay attention to my, to my peers yeah. and I can see what's happening with actors. And it's really exciting when I see a friend kind of just land in their sweet spot. And it, it usually just happens with a certain amount of um, tenacity and grace and just evolving into it without pushing too hard. Yeah. And the hard part is of course, the persistence to stick it out while that's happening Oof, because man. there's all those chances or opportunities or dilemmas where people are nagging at you maybe to move back home or maybe the spouse is saying are you sure this is really what you want to do why don't we go get a real estate license there's all these other things that start to nag and the actor that really is working on their craft is constantly thinking of how they can become a better storyteller and then as the patience to grow into their next type that's huge but it requires a self-awareness of what is your type and who are you and how do you how do casting directors perceive you? Right. you know, what, is, what is your headshot? Man? What is that signature headshot? And what is it in just a couple of words? Are you whatever, you know, blue collar, blue collar dad, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, uh, office, office uh, intern, whatever. You know, you just need to be a type. Right. And then we grow we grow in and out of them. So um, yeah, actors need to be aware that. There's no conspiracy out there. No one is sitting around in a boardroom saying, let's just make sure this guy or this woman doesn't work. <laughs> you know, it's, it's up to the actor to continue to get better and better at their, at their craft and then continue to make sure they've got the type of representation that can keep getting your headshot and your product in front of the gatekeepers. So there, for what all that's worth. I remember uh, when I was heading into my 30s, I remember my agent kind of going, oh, okay all right, into your 30s. And I was like, wait, what? What does that mean? What does that mean? And the unwritten rule was that 
guys don't really work in their 30s. And I was like, ah, I'm on a good roll right now. I'll be fine. And yeah. I wasn't. I, I went through a five-year period. There you where, go. Where uh, agents wouldn't even sit down with me. And I already had yep. 35 guest star credits to my name and 50-some commercials or whatever it was. And it was as though I didn't exist. And I yep. had to you just get through it. Yeah, so maybe it was it was no more complicated than you you weren't the college kid anymore. They couldn't cast you as the frat guy, but you were not believable yet as a young dad. That's right. And in between there, right there, college kid and young dad, there's a chasm. And there's yeah. some other stuff that you can get in between, but from a casting perspective, you know, there's a lot more when you're right in those big, you know, sandboxes. Right. So, uh, yeah, well, you've, you've had that self-awareness, but you've been consistent just like me. We somehow... Yeah, not somehow we've we've uh, you know, we've done the work. We've done the, the work. most important thing is to keep doing the work. There's a whole lot of luck in there, too. And j just great timing. My goodness. Absolutely. Time, timing's everything. But yeah. timing is often timing is often often a matter of, you know, not not being distracted. Right. Not not moonlighting and, and making this a hobby. You know, this is a this is a very tough industry to really. um be fruitful in if, if you're dabbling, if you're, if it's a hobby, if you're kind of just saying, oh, I'll give it a shot and you're not really all in, it, it, it really does require an all in uh, plunge. Um, and that's just not easy for a lot of people um, for all the obvious reasons, because it's a, it's a gigantic leap of faith with very little security. So when you say all in, I've got students who come to me and say, Josh, uh, I've decided I'm going to commit to being a working actor and I'm quitting my job as an engineer or I'm quitting my job as a whatever and I'm focusing on acting. Is that what you mean by fully committed? Uh, boy, that's an extreme. That's an extreme, right? Because that's that's pretty hard to do. Again, now because of the, the way the industry has shifted, you could actually do that now because you don't have to be available during the day. Mm -hmm. And there was a reason once upon a time actors were all in the service industry as waiters and servers, right? Uh, and, and, and nighttime workers, because you had to have your, your daylight hours free to go and meet casting directors, right? So that, that's that been lifted from us temporarily. We'll see if it, if it sticks. So now you could uh, have a day job and do your self tapes. Mm -hmm. uh, giving up a career that's probably uh, providing a certain amount of financial security. It all depends on you know your, your family situation, what your needs are for your overhead. Um, that's that's a tough thing to do to, to quit something and just focus on your acting. Um, is that what I mean by all in? That, that certainly is part of it, but that's a hard thing to advise is to is to tell someone to give up their their uh, financial security to do this. It's really about um, are you in it for the long haul? In other words, it, it, you know, if you were if you were really it had your feet held to the fire. Are you the type of person that is really in the back of your mind, whether you would articulate it or not, saying, I'm going to give this three years. Mm. I'm going to give this five years and see what happens. If that's your mindset going in, good luck. Good luck. And it might happen. You, you could catch lightning in a bottle and get on a, uh, you know, be in a, an independent film or find the right agent and get on a TV series. And boom, you are literally almost an overnight success. But if you're kind of looking at it like, I'm going to give it this amount of time, that's what I mean by all in. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the artists that are finding the most fulfilling day-to-day uh, -day rewards from our business know that this is a lifetime endeavor, that they are an, are, they're an artist for life. And that's a loose term, loose definition of the word art. You know, that doesn't just necessarily mean actor. That means storytelling in a wide variety of ways. You could, you could deviate and move over to filmmaking, producing, directing, um, maybe singing, maybe, maybe voiceovers, uh, maybe writing. Maybe you realize that you'd much rather work in the art department and, and, and be a set decorator. Um, all of that is kind of this holistic approach of this is an industry of storytelling and I want to be part of it because it moves people and it gives people um, um, a reminder that we're all uh, part of the same human race and the things that really connect storytellers, right? Mm -hmm. And it's that, well, that's what I mean by all in. Are you, is this a lifetime endeavor that you're, that you're aspiring to be in this forever? Is that more clarification? I, yeah, I love that. Yeah, and you, and you could do that while also being an electrician. Right. Right? Yeah. But if you're saying, I'll see if I get on a TV series, if I don't in three years, 
the hell with it. I'm an electrician. I'm making good money. And I guess the art, the arts weren't cut out for me. That's yeah. I, I would have a hard time bringing an actor like that into my studio because that's not the language I talk. I talk this language of, you know, we are on this grand journey. And if we're result oriented, then we're going to find ourselves more often than not very discouraged and feeling a little bit like we're left out of the party. Mm. And it's, if you just look at it as, man, this is something I'm committing my life to just being, being around storytellers, being part of the storytelling industry in whatever form that is going to evolve into in front of me, because I'm going to take it day by day and not constantly have this false kind of brass ring out in front of me that I'm striving for something. And trust me, you know me, I'm very goal oriented. I, yeah. I, I, I circle dates on calendars and then I hit my marks and I accomplish things at the same time because things don't always move at the pace we would like them to more often than not, they don't. It really is, you know, a, a kind of a, a snail's pace often to get projects developed, get them to completion. You have to have a lot of daily practices and habits that ground you back into, I love this, man. I know things are moving slow, but man, I've got all this time to sit with my creative imagination and continue to study film and continue to read really, uh, you know, significant fiction or listen to music that inspires me or go to a museum and discover new artists or, or support my friends or uh, elevate my students. All these things can fill those little gaps while I'm waiting to achieve my goals. And that's a daily, that's a daily existence that can keep me, keep me fired up. Are those the things that you do to to keep you fired up in the in the lulls? Yes, all day, every day. I, I, I also love sports. I'm very, you know, sports for me, I call it the toy department because it's the one place where I can still kind of just detach from all the things that I'm thinking about artistically, which really do uh, consume most of my energy. But I love sports, so I'm able to give them their place. I, I no longer take it as seriously as I used to. I don't, the, the highs and lows of winning and losing are, are not as dramatic for me, but I do spend a, a lot of time watching sports and there's a lot to be learned from pro athletes. Mm -hmm. And I use sports analogies often in the studio because everyone, most people can relate to them. I mean, just look at what happens with, with this, with this gymnast pulling out because of her mental health mm -hmm. yeah. and she, she pulled out uh, because she just said she wasn't feeling it. She felt like she was maybe going to get hurt and her nerves got the best for her. Well, what actor doesn't need to be reminded that stage fright and the nervousness that we get when we're about to audition or when we're about to step in front of the camera or when we're going to step on stage for a live audience? Actors need to be reminded or made aware that the best athletes, and I'm talking the very best athletes in the world, are going through the same thing and not always conquering that. And, and sometimes it's going to get the best of you. And, and artists need to know that, hey, man, that nervous energy, that stage fright, that, uh, you know, whatever those butterflies are that prevent us from doing the best work we want to do. That's not all that unique, man. Everyone's going through that. So find your own way to, to overcome that to the best of your ability. And then realize, you know what, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. You're going to be okay. So you've been at this a long time and, and 34 years, 34. And that's just in Hollywood. You were, Correct. you were geek. Well, I came out here to act. Oh. So I was not an actor before I got to LA. Okay. You know? Yeah, I come from writers and I, I wanted to be a sports journalist. So I, my, my, uh, both my parents are writers and my uh, brother and sister went higher education route. I dropped out of college, decided I didn't want to be a sports journalist. So I moved to Hawaii and decided I wanted to do that for a couple of years because <laughs> that was, that seemed like a pretty good education to me. So it was white Waikiki where I, I, I had, I just got hit by a lightning bolt one night, uh, figuratively, not literally. And said, I think I'm like, I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to move to LA and pursue acting. So I moved to Maui for a year, socked away some dough at a five-star restaurant. And then just kind of, like I told you, I'm very good at setting dates on calendar and saying, here's when I'm doing it. Here's how I'm going to go about it and game planning. And then I've never looked back. I, I arrived Los Angeles, July 8th, 1987. Wow. First job, first speaking line on TV. I got one line on General Hospital. Hey, Matthews, you got a phone call. I was in a locker room. I was a I was a professional football player. I played a lot of dumb jocks in the beginning of my career. Like kind of had a Dolph, had a Dolph Lundgren look, you know, but yeah. more, a little more corn fed. So I played a lot of big knucklehead jocks. If you look at the beginning of my career, I was on a lot of sitcoms. Um, and then I just started booking a lot of TV commercials. So I had a lot of early success and uh, just never looked back, man. Always uh, just kind of kept the momentum going and 
always was studying, always either in a class or always looking to join my next theater company. Mm. So I never, um, because I was working, I never paused and said, well, now that I'm working, I don't need class. I don't, I don't need to be working out anywhere. I'm already, look at my resume. It's already growing. And I've only been here five years on the contrary. I always said, man, I, I really don't know much. I know for a fact <clears throat> I'm behind in terms of training. A lot of the actors I'm going to be competing against uh, have gone to drama school. Some of them, a lot of, I mean, it's, I started a, a theater company in the early nineties with a bunch of Ivy leaguers, exclusively Ivy leaguers. And these are a lot of people I'm still very good friends with to this very day. And I don't know how I, and I was one of the founding members <clears throat> and I don't know how they let me, you know, <clears throat> write up the mission statement for this theater company. And they all went to Brown, NYU and Yale. Oh, wow. And, I, and, and, and me, this, this Minnesota college dropout. Um, um, but I, but my point is I was surrounded by people that really had significant training. So I've, I've never stopped working. And now I, I don't have to, my teaching now is my working out because I'm constantly teaching and that teaches me so much and keeps me sharp. Boy, ain't that the truth. Holy cow. And I know. Right. Oh. Cause you learn, you learn so much from directing your actors. So much. It, so well, it, re it reinforces what you think works because then you see it work with others or not. Right. And then, um, you know, you continue to, uh, you know, if you're smart. You could continue to adapt. I think when I joined your class, was when I really began to understand what being a student of this craft is, because you still are constantly posting what movie you're watching today on Instagram, yeah. you know, like, yeah, you're, you are. And why I'm watching it. And why you're watching it and what's great about this particular thing. And although this one might not be a great movie, here's what I'm getting out of it. And here's what I'm yeah. sharing with you. Like you just, you have this heart of a teacher and this heart of a let's put a team together and put up a show and have a blast. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that heart is costing me a lot of money, man. <laughs> I got to stop putting all my, I got to stop putting all my money into my own films, but <laughs> I swear to God, I, I just don't know any other way, man, I guess. Uh, uh, but it's, it's that very spirit, man. I just love, you know, casting my friends and writing, writing roles for you guys. And then, uh, and then making, making product. But yeah, man, uh, uh, Instagram, the social media stuff has been fun. I, I think it's still something I need to get better at. Mm. But I know for a fact, uh, my Lace Man 34 that I, the, that I do exclusively uh, post on the films that I'm watching, I, I, get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of joy out of that because it's, it's fun just in a couple of sentences to say, here's this film was directed by so-and-so. This is why it's great. This is why I love it whatever. And then I love extracting moments from films with, with, with actors that are demonstrating the kind of work that we teach. Uh -huh. Right. So that you can, you know, you, you, I use my face, the Lacey group Facebook page for that to, to show the actors and say, you know, watch this. Sometimes it's just a two or three minute clip, but watch what's happening in the scene. Watch what the actors are doing with their hands. Watch how they're using independent activities. Watch how the silent moments are far more significant than the moments when the actors are speaking all the things that we teach, but uh, it's very, very helpful, I think, for, to, to, for them to see it demonstrated because, you know, another sports analogy, the best coaches can lose the room, as they say, where your voice just starts to get tuned out because you're talking too much and you're too repetitive and you're saying the same things every week. So my two answers to that is when in doubt, I just go back and quote the book and say, listen, you don't have to take it from me. You know, it's in the book. Yeah. Or. I show a film clip of actors doing what we teach and say, that's what it looks like. So that's the kind of work you should be aspiring to do. So yeah, every day a student, man, watching and absorbing. I love it. I love it. So uh, there is some question as to how to define working actor. And I would love to know your thoughts on this because the, the range of, of, actor activities is yeah. so broad from being completely unemployed to I can't turn work away fast enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's one, it's one of those terms that um, it has a very, it's, there's a status attached to it. That's really um, both warranted and a bit misleading. Mm. The status is, I think that the actor that gets labeled a working actor is someone that has made a career out of it and their resume speaks to that. You can look at their resume 
and say, oh, okay, I see the credits, I see the stage work. This is an actor that is always working, right? Um, but does it necessarily mean you have a steady paycheck, right? Uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that because so few of us do. Um, <laughs> having said that, once you work enough, Josh, right, we get a lot of residuals. Yeah. So even on the weeks when I'm feeling sorry for myself and wondering, you know, um, when the next windfall is coming and I can go on to Screen Actors Guild, the, the website and go, wow, okay, Criminal Minds is delivering again or Grey's Anatomy is paying my rent again. Yeah. So that resume does provide a residual income, which keeps you um, out of uh, moonlighting and doing something else. Mm. Uh, it's very hard to take on another career and then also have a, an all in full dedicated approach to this art form and this journey. That's not to say that you couldn't do a wide variety of things to supplement your income, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, the key is, are you doing something else to supplement your income, but you are still as focused as you've ever been on what it is you're striving for, be it to uh, be TV work, film work, commercial work, stage work, or just a really holistic approach that you want a life of just staying in the game, mm -hmm. being a part of Hollywood in whatever manifestation that takes on. That All of that to me represents this idea that you wanna work in the industry. And it helps, of course, if you've made some money and, and, and have a resume to, uh, to, to back that up and some residual income. So it's, it's a very vague term in some respects, but what it means to me is it's a, a serious actor who uh, does make um, at least part of their living, if not the majority of their living from their professional acting work to the point where anything else else they're doing is merely supplemental, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and and, and they are uh, and they are you know all they're all in, in in terms of they're they're not looking, you know, giving it eighteen more months and then then they're going to call it quits because the industry has changed too much and right they've got they've got kind of one foot in the industry at this point. Those are the kind of things I look for when I'm when I would call someone a working actress. So that person is has done the work. They got a resume, they've made an income. It does, for the most part, it supports them and they're all in, they're still full speed ahead. Yeah. Right. And then there's those lucky ones that get on a series and that's going to happen to you very soon. So just keep working. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, yeah. if, if you see me looking away, by the way, it's because yeah. you're giving me such gold. I've got a zillion questions going through my mind. Oh, shit. My ADD, I'm having to write right. them down so I don't lose no, them. No, you're doing great, man. Did I, <laughs> did I answer that question uh, uh, with a, a little bit of clarity? No, you did. I love it. I love it. Um, when did you first feel like a working actor? When did it dawn on you and go, oh, my God, I think I've made it? That's where I just, you know, so a lot of the stuff that I uh, teach and advise and hammer away at with with all of you, and in, in, in particular the students that are that are right now in my classroom, are, is this tenacity, this perseverance to stay the course and to not let the gaps discourage you, and to have habits and a lifestyle that can sustain you when you're not working. Having said that, I've just been one of the lucky ones. Um, uh, fortunate is maybe a better word, um, where things have just worked from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And steadily, they've continued to work. So even my even my uh, worst years financially were better than most people's, mm -hmm. right? So I, from a very early time on, even when I was waiting tables in the early '90s when I first got to LA, that was very much supplemental. I mean, I was giving away shifts. I was the one that all the way, and I worked at you know a couple of really nice places. And they were playing my the other, you know, oh, just go to Lacey. He'll give you a shift because he does, he never has to work. I was already doing sitcoms and, oh, wow. you know, at least a half a dozen commercials a year and three or four either co-star or guest star bookings a year already out of the gate at 23, 24, 25. So did I uh, stop and go, wow, I'm going to put a flag in the, in the ground. I am a working actor. I think I kind of did. I think I just always knew that I belonged in that conversation without having to pound my chest because at such a young age you don't want to alienate people around you that have been there for 10 years longer 15 and yeah. haven't had the success as you know this is an industry that's very hard on that yeah you don't want to you don't want to stick your head too much above the crowd because there's a lot of people striving for what you're going for and the resentment and the envy um can be toxic and you want to do everything you can to make sure you're not 
feeding into that and, and, and being too uh, outspoken about your success. Right. You know, I wish it wasn't that way, but as you know, you and I, I mean, how, look how much we pull for each other. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's what you want is you want to create a community in a studio where everyone is really openly, aggressively, enthusiastically pulling for each other. Yeah. Cause it's not a zero sum game just because Josh is working. Doesn't mean John's not going to. That's right. Right. There's plenty of work for Josh and there's plenty of work for John. And we need to celebrate each other. I made a point uh, as, as I kind of turned the corner into my 30s and in, mid, through my 30s as I got married and had children of really um, befriending the guys that I saw at the auditions that I was always going up against yep. and not treating them at adversarially as if they were taking food off of my table, but making sure that, that I, they knew uh, if I didn't get it, I wanted them to get it, even if it was just a platitude. Even if it was just lip service, say it anyway. Right. Put out, put out that good, that good vibe and karma. That, hey man, I'm pulling for you. I hope I, uh, there's there's work for both of us. Amen. And some of my best friends uh, over the years have been guys that are exactly my type. Uh, are competed against. I've only got a only got a couple of actors around town whose careers I look at and go that guy man <laughs> god man why is his career so much and i'm certainly not going to name names so i'm by no means ab above it because it's very very natural i would imagine it's natural in, in, in any in industry to look at a contemporary that suddenly is escalating faster than you and go what the hell am i doing wrong <laughs> what has he got that i don't have or what is, what's so great about her and not about me it's very tempting to do that and I'm not above that, uh, but you know, there's a couple actors in particular that I, every time I see him on TV, I go, "Mother, there he is again, man!" And I say, so "I've even, I've even, you know, rattled my my manager's cage and said, you know, so and so just got another series. What the f, you know? <laughs> what?" And, and she always comes back with, "Not what I want to hear." Right. <laughs> you know, so was, one time I was going, well, "Well, John, he's in, he's in really good shape," and I said. What the <laughs> <laughs> the, hell, the hell does that mean? Yeah, I know. Not what I wanted to hear. So, well, John, he's attractive. <laughs> oh, bro. I don't be, well, John, be careful when you be careful when you go fishing for compliments to your manager. He yeah. might just give you the straight poop. Yeah, I got hammered on that one. <laughs> so, That's so right. what do you do to like when you feel that coming up? Do you just kind of acknowledge it, let it be what it is, or do you fight it? Uh, acknowledge it. Let it be what it is. Uh, don't wear it on your sleeve. Certainly don't, uh, don't tear anyone down. You know, don't, don't go, you know, I, I, I have, it's a responsibility on me to, to go into class and to go into the studio with the actors that are looking to me for some guidance and not tear anyone down. Um, I, I misstep every now and then pointing out an actor, maybe doing work that I think is mediocre, mm -hmm. but I won't, I won't tear anyone down for working for right. getting the work. Right. right. Um, because it's, again, man, you know, it's, uh, you're just going to have a much happier life if you just convince yourself that it's better just to pull for everyone yeah. and then be hoping that everyone's doing okay. And that's, that they're, you know, that they, even when it seems like they're kicking ass and, and, and soaring above you, they, they might have, uh, or not might, they, they most likely have a, a lot of stuff that they're stressed out about. Also, you know, the grass isn't always greener. Yeah. But man, some of those, some of those gigs, man, those, you know, you know, five, six, seven years on a, on a series and exotic locations, and shit, you know, uh, only my, you know, exotic location for me is when I shoot in Phoenix, you know, this here's, here, why, why is this guy always shooting in New Zealand, you know? <laughs> Hey, we're I going to, to go to you know, Dale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or you know, Portland, maybe. Yeah. I'm going to Portland to make a make a TV show. Oh yeah, so and so's in you know, you know, uh, Argentina for three months. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, I, I get over it. Well, you have to. You have to. You have to. Yeah. You go crazy otherwise. So let me ask you this: going back to the very beginning. So you're well, you're, you're in Hawaii, and what is it? that smacks you upside the head and makes you realize that this is what you want to do with your life. I mean, you I was wait I, I was waiting tables at a at a at a as all places in Waikiki are a very tourist spot right on the beach of the right, you know right next to the Royal Hawaiian with Diamond Head in the background. It was one of the outrigger hotels. The restaurant was called the Blue Dolphin Room and I was one of the nighttime waiters and you really feel like you're on display. You people are there on they're on vacation. They've been to a luau, they've got their kids. They're looking for more than just a waiter. They want someone to say, you know, here's what I would recommend. Here's the, you know, the best whale watching tour. Or this is the best luau. 
oh my God, make sure you drive here. You become almost like a, a concierge, like, like an ambassador. And in doing that and, and opening my, that part of my personality up to basically like hosting the dinner guests at my table, I, I would find repeatedly that people would come back through the course of their vacation and request that they come sit with me again. And, you, you know, my, the hostess would say, oh, this table, these, these people really want to come and sit with you again because they really liked you. And it was that type of adulation and validation of my storytelling and my charisma, for lack of a better word. And I like a lightning bolt one night. I just I remember it so clearly because it's Waikiki and the moon was there and Diamond Head was there and I'm opening a bottle of wine, you know, and I'm, you know, contemplating my existence, having a very kind of Nietzsche moment. And I said, oh, what, why the hell didn't I think of that earlier? I'll move to Los Angeles and become an actor. My problem is solved. <laughs> and, I, and I swear to God, Josh, I've never looked back. I've never for one moment since that lightning bolt looked back on that and thought, ah, what was I thinking? Maybe I should uh, hedge my bed here a little bit and uh, make sure that I know how to do drywall. I never once. I've just, I said, oh, man, it dawned on me. I don't know why it dawned on me so late at, what, you know, I was 20. Um, yeah, that's how it happened. So, crazy huh so you never had a plan b nope did not much to my parents chagrin they were very very much uh concerned that this was uh very uh, a, a kind of a fly by night kind of uh, uh, uh an infatuation with something that you know yeah that was going to that was going to flame out um yeah. and then they started seeing me on commercials and uh sitcoms and like i said i just i hit the ground running and a lot of things might have gone differently i'm not saying i'm any different than anyone else had i not found early success and if i would have had big gaps in the beginning of my career in my 20s where nothing was happening i mean crickets and i couldn't get that better agent or i couldn't get in the door to meet the casting directors if i had that prolonged drought that might have worn me down and i might have found something else to do yeah it does wear but you i didn't it does wear you down let me let oh, me ask you, what when you started working when you uh, started settling into this work, what did you find that you were totally unprepared for? Initially, when I first started working professionally, I was unprepared for all the sitting around that you do when you're on when you're working professionally, because from a Minnesota upbringing, a Midwestern kind of value system. You just, you know, you see a bunch of people carrying, doing cables and, and lifting apple boxes and pulling the flags over for the, for the, for the grip and the camera department and the art department. You just want to help. You right. just want to go, hey, man, I can grab that. Yeah. You know, I, you can tell suddenly everything's rushed and there's, we're, we're chasing the light or whatever. And the Minnesota and me, we always, we all stand, I can help and we can, we can all get done a lot faster, but you can't, you can't touch anything. Right. I mean, by Screen Actors Guild union bylaws, man, you just you are there to do your specific job and everything is covered by somebody else. And it is your job to be prepared for being in front of the camera. And that's something I really emphasize with my actors is, yeah, there may be a lot of sitting around. You may be dormant most of the day when you're working professionally, but look around and see how hard everyone else is working. And when it's your turn to step in front of the camera, trust me, they are all going to expect you to step in front of the camera and knock out of the park on the first day. Yeah. And don't think that you get to step up and get a couple of mulligans and you're going to work your way into it by the third, fourth, fifth, sixth take as a guest star. You're going to get three if you're lucky. First one, you want to crush it. So in case they do just say, hey, that's pretty damn good. Let's walk away. Right. <laughs> and that's happened. Yeah, And then you can just see the actor going, uh, I thought that was kind of my rehearsal take. <laughs> uh, don't we get to do it again? As, as a guest star, you really don't get to raise your hand and say, I'd like another one. <laughs> so you better knock out your first take because they might just say, hey, man, we love it. Moving on. Uh, if, if you get three takes, man, you want to make sure all three of them are great so the editor can't, can't cut together an uneven performance. So That's they better all three, they, they, they better all three be good and you better match all of your physical continuity so you're not an editor's nightmare. Mm. So... That was the first thing I learned was how much sitting around there is uh, working professionally uh, and what that meant. What that meant was you've got a lot of time to overcome the challenge of losing your focus. Ooh. Right. It's very easy to just hang out at the craft service table and go sit in a little gossip circle with your other actors and complain about the industry or pat yourself on the back for how great you are. And suddenly, man, it's it's go time for you in 15 minutes. And you really should have been preparing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's what I do now, man. I, I, I never get caught flat footed on a set. I never, I never allow myself to get caught up in just the, the, the long conversations, the gossipy stuff. I, you know, I'm certainly cordial with people and I'll get into the, the occasional small talk for sure, especially if it's not a demanding role. But for the most part, man, I know I'm, I'm there to crush it and I sequester myself either in my trailer or somewhere on the set and I stay locked in. That's tough to do. There's a lot of um, big time energy management that that uh, was one thing that I hadn't even considered until a, a buddy of mine uh, mentioned that when he was working on Will and Grace. And I was like, energy management, what, I don't yeah. know what you mean. And he kind of explained it. And I was like, oh, holy cow. And that just completely shifted my experience of being on set. The right way to put it. Yeah. Managing one's energy so that you can be ready to step up and hit it out of the park. Absolutely. And then there's things that are out of your control. You know, it's um, nobody really likes to go to work right after lunch. You notice right after a big, long, you know, 60 minute lunch break that becomes like 80 minutes. Everyone's tired. You look around and most people are looking for a place to sit. People are kind of going back to their trailer if they can. But guess what? They're going to they're go start setting up the next shots because right. they got to make their day. And if you know for a fact your close-up coverage is going to be right after lunch, then maybe you shouldn't overeat. You know, you might you might just want to put your lunch in tinfoil and eat later. Yeah. And you go and take your lunch time to sit in your trailer and load up your emotional condition and step out there and and not have that food coma. Right. And uh, that that happens all the time, where you know the actor the actor is hitting their stride in the morning and they're, they're you're covering the scene. And everyone's getting their coverage and you can see the writing on the wall. that They're about to about to break for lunch and your close up is probably coming up pretty soon. But lunch is right there. He goes, yeah, man, my, my close up is going to be right after lunch when everybody's tired. Uh, so you, you need to you need to uh, anticipate that and adjust for it. How much do you eat on set? Uh, you mean as in when, when it's a meal and you're sitting to have a meal or like gra grazing? Yeah, I mean, all of it, just kind of throughout. I, the I, used, I used to be much, much more of a grazer. I'm much less now. Um, I, I, I'm a sucker for a breakfast burrito right when you get there. Man. I, lo I love the, the, almost every catering company just makes great breakfast burritos. Oftentimes, I'll wrap it in tinfoil, and I won't have it until after I've worked. Um, do I eat a big eh, Not too much. One yeah. piece of fish, some veggies, whatever the starch is. I try not to eat any bread when I'm working because it gets stuck in my throat. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Not, not too much. Let me ask you, there, there's a lot that we sacrifice as actors to make this career, make this life work. And I think a lot of times we, we don't know that we're sacrificing it until we get to it. What do you find that you've had to sacrifice? Uh, well, uh, family time for sure. I, I uh, it just became a very predictable, common um, point of contention in my family that we would book, have our summer trip, be it the kind of the regular summer stuff that we would do with uh, with my wife and our three kids. We'd go back to Long Island and spend time with her dad or even any kind of trip that was planned uh, invariably. You know what they say? You want to book a job, book a flight. And uh, when we when we when actors try to plan to leave town and, and, and get away, be it on a family vacation or otherwise, uh, quite often it gets gets uh, sabotaged by work. And of course, it's a good problem to have. But I've lost a lot of family time on vacations because of bookings. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was not. Um, you know, it's a good problem to have, but it was not easy for me my wife and kids to always know that I was either going to come late to the vacation or leave early. Right. So that was a significant sacrifice. Um, security, you know, I think uh, most people are warriors. Am I, am I, do I worry more than most people? Maybe because I take a lot of projects on and I put a lot of wheels in motion. So I have a lot of people looking to me for completion on things. And maybe that's added to my stress level and worry. Um, but this, this career choice does not offer a whole lot of financial security and predictability in terms of how things are going to unfold in any calendar year of, of how we survive. Um, 
just on practical purposes, right? So we don't have a lot of that. Um, having said that, I don't think you and I are cut out for bankers hours. I don't, I've never worked in an office. I don't know what it's like to punch a clock in that respect. Uh, you know, I watch TV shows about office culture. Then the main one is the office, right? Everyone loves the office. That is t totally foreign to me. I've never worked in an office. I don't know what the cubicle lifestyle is like. That's a culture that I, I have zero understanding of. And I've done very little of it even in my acting work where I play any characters that work in an office environment. I've done a lot of cops and stuff that are in bullpens, but uh, I've never I've never worked in an office. So it's um, I don't think I was cut out for it. So yeah. I don't feel like that. I don't feel like that was a sacrifice, but the security that comes with that type of uh, lifestyle must be nice to know, you know, you have escalated pay raises built in, you have vacation days, you know, gold watch for this, you know, set of, steak, set of steak knives for this. Everything for me is movies, right? <laughs> Second prize is set of, set of steak knives. Third prize is you're fired. Put the coffee down. Coffee's for closers. Yeah. If, if, if I haven't seen it in a movie, I can't relate to it. <laughs> you know, you know that's true. I do. I, 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 do. I get. I only survive by my film references. <laughs> uh, most influential film, and I know that's a ridiculous uh, question to ask, but I know there's probably a dozen or more. But what yeah. you, you thing comes to mind? Uh, Magnolia, Paul Thomas Anderson. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so bold. I love that kind of tapestry storytelling where there's a wide variety, an ensemble of characters and all of their stories mesh to a certain degree and everyone's living in the same world and playing by the same rules. And then you, he breaks the rules right at about the 80 minute mark and all of the characters are suddenly singing a song by Amy Mann. Mm. You know, all of them are singing suddenly and he, and he doesn't stop to explain why it's just a style choice that he's confident enough to put in there. Um, the the opening um, piece with with the with the uh, with the um, uh, the narration, um, Ricky Jay's narration at the top of the, the you know the talking about coincidences and fate, and then spiraling into the one is the loneliest number by Amy Mann the cover, and then meeting all of those fabulous characters, and then the work man I mean just the theme of regret that that that, that steady theme of regret through the picture. What I love about Paul Thomas Anderson is he takes a central theme that uh, is gnawing at him or, or is, is part of his internal conflict as a man. Mm -hmm. He takes that theme and he just grinds the shit out of it in a film. Mm -hmm. So in There Will Be Blood, you know, it's how power corrupts and ultimately ultimate power corrupts ultimately. Mm -hmm. So There Will Be Blood is about, you know, someone who starts off by himself in this oil mine right all by himself doing all the backbreaking work literally the first 15 minutes with no dialogue you see daniel plain view falling down the well and breaking his back just to try to scratch petroleum right and then you see where he ends and look what it you know it cost him everything it, the, the power that he was aspiring to you know crushed his soul magnolia is all about regret and all of the characters are dealing with regret. And those moments that, that as the film reaches its emotional peak with Philip Baker Hall dealing with the fact that he molested his daughter and his wife finally calling him on it. You know, Frank T.J. Mackey kneeling at the bedside of, of his dad, you know, Earl Partridge, who was this TV producer. And then he's, you know, left, left uh, him and his mom, him and his, you know, his mom when he was a kid and Frank T.J. Mackey's just got to get one last pound of flesh out of him. And as as Jason Robards is dying, he still he says, don't you dare leave me. Don't you leave me, you son of a bitch. I mean, I could start to cry right now because yeah. the work is so emotionally grounded and the theme is so relevant and it's present in every scene. And it's just a masterpiece of storytelling, ensemble acting, music, editing, uh, craftsmanship on display on such a grand scale that it's everything I strive for in my filmmaking. And you'll be very happy to know that the uh, there's two emotional landings in Rosebud Lane. For those who are watching this podcast, Josh is fabulous in my new film, Rosebud Lane, which is almost ready to be submitted to film festivals this coming weekend. Right I've on. got a rough cut I can't wait to show you. But we've got two emotional endings of the picture. And one is basically called the morning after montage, which is the morning after the climax of the picture. Right. You know what I'm talking about. 
basically two people have been killed. And now it's the morning after in a small town. And we need to see how everyone is reacting to that because this is a small town and homicides, or murders don't happen very often. And there's a two minute montage of all the characters dealing with it in their own way. And it's set to a gorgeous piece of music. And it reminds me very much of Magnolia. And that's by design. I gave my I gave my my composer Magnolia to watch and a couple of scenes in particular and said, I'd love for it to I'd love to kind of come close to this feeling, the feeling that we're getting here of of sorrow with just a hint of optimism and just a hint of reflective hope. Mm -hmm. And we nailed it. And I'm so happy because I, when I watch it now uh, and you're all over it, you've got a couple of great moments in it. A couple of the most poignant moments are yours. Oh, cool. And it, it and it feels like Magnolia. Uh, so talk about something that was a direct influence on me. It's 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 in everything that I do. And I'm just a huge Paul Thomas Anderson fan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I remember actually going to the Magnolia screening and nice. going to the party afterwards. I forget where it was, but but just kind of like after that moment, after that. Wow. Film, and then seeing everybody there and Tom with his with his four bodyguards. And it wow. Was how did how did how did you get invited to that? So I, I knew and still know the person who was running the show on, on, on that screening. And they kind of were like, Hey, come on in, come on. Wow. And I, oh, that would have been what 1999, 2000. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, I was fresh to LA wow. and um, yeah, I got super lucky. That's and a nice peek behind the curtain. Yeah, it sure was. It sure was. It, uh, it was amazing to see Tom Cruise, like Tom fricking Cruise, just to be so approachable and such a gentleman, yeah. such a, uh, a charming, available human being. It was really, uh, I was quite chuffed, you know? Yeah, well, it sounds like it, it had uh, an influence on you also. Sure. And did. I know we've talked, we've talked about the film. I know you're a fan. Oh, big time. How can yeah. you? I mean, I, yeah. it's, it's one of those films that just gets me in the solar plexus, you know, when, big time. when uh, Robards has that beautiful, tragic line when he says life is so long yeah so long yeah no. so long. <laughs> i know so long so and that was his that was his final film yeah. was it was it really yeah, yeah. wow yeah you have and, a and look at him you have a philosophy um that i really dig and it's it's that actors are better served not to watch actors but to watch directors it's it's yeah to, to not follow actors but follow right. directors. Right. In other words, you know if you have a favorite actor and you want you're going to see everything they're in, you're going to be disappointed a lot. Um, very few exceptions. I mean, Daniel Day Lewis does not do cash grabs. He's not going to be in a Marvel movie. Right. So you, you, Daniel Day Lewis, even Philip Hoffman, pretty much an exception. Phil Hoffman did do a Mission Impossible, but it, it, even that was a pretty good performance. By and large, though, if you follow actors, you're going to be disappointed because they're going to get for a wide variety of reasons, they're gonna end up in films that were out of their control, obviously, and weren't very good. Uh, the directors that you choose to follow, that you, that you tend to gravitate to their storytelling, once you find out what, who the directors are that you really love, follow them and, and that will inform a lot of what it is that you want to do with your work, what kind of storyteller you are. Um, in other words, if Wes Anderson is your favorite filmmaker, that probably says something about the kind of work you wanna do. You know, for lack of a better word, you probably do want to do things that are kind of quirky and kind of off center and maybe a little bit more lighthearted mm -hmm. and have a little bit of an unpredictable, zany kind of quality. To it. If the Coen brothers are your favorite filmmakers, then that informs you. You know, for me, Paul Thomas Anderson, as a filmmaker and an actor, he just does deep dives on everything. He doesn't do anything casual. Everything is the deepest, most profound, gut wrenching expression of that theme. Everything is on steroids with Paul Thomas Anderson. And that's what I want to do. I want to do things that are always at 12 on a scale of one to 10. Um, if, you, if you're a Francis Coppola fan, then you probably like things to be somewhat operatic. Uh -huh. you, like to, you like things to build towards grand moments of cinema where music and everything crescendos at a, at a, at a, a singular moment when everything is working in that moment. If you're a John Cassavetes fan or a Robert Altman fan, you know, and those are the two, your two favorite filmmakers. And that probably means you like big master shots where the actors can breathe and there's room for improvisation 
and you don't really like conventional coverage in how you shoot things. You don't need two shots and singles. You like for things to play out. Um, and that's a very specific style of storytelling. And you will know that about yourself by becoming a fan of Cassavetes or Mike Lee or Robert Altman. So when you start to really pay attention to who the filmmakers are, uh, you'll learn more about what kind of stuff you want to do. And the more specific you can be about the kind of work you want to do, what you see yourself in, what you visualize yourself doing for the remainder of your artistic life, the more specific you are, the more the universe is going to correspond and deliver you those opportunities because you're going to notice them. You're going you're to acknowledge them and identify them because you'll, that's what I want to do and you'll pounce on it. Maybe it's a stage opportunity to work with someone who's doing something very avant-garde, like a, a kind of a, a Charlie, uh, you know, a, a Kaufman who did, oh, did yeah. you know, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And if you've seen Synecdoche, which is just a, this great film about someone who dedicates their life to the theater and you watch Phil Hoffman in Synecdoche and you go, wow, you know, Charlie Kaufman, that's that's the way I see things. I see things as being very abstract and everything's a film within a film within a film. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to learn a lot more about yourself by realizing who are the directors you, than you admire rather than who are the actors that you enjoy. Now mm -hmm. find from an actor's perspective, what you can learn by f falling in love with actors is what, what is it about the actor that you like? You know, wh why do you love Nicolas Cage? You know, why do you love Kate Blanchett or Viola Davis? And I love talking to actors about that because that's worth analysis and that's worth not necessarily mimicking, but uh, emulating in the sense that um, give yourself permission to be as bold as Nicolas Cage, to, to always give yourself uh, uh, the freedom and permission to have unpredictable, zany moments that seemingly come out of nowhere. Make that your your mission statement as an actor to be unpredictable. I mean, no one's more unpredictable than Nicolas Cage. Yeah. That's, that's why he's become this kind of cult hero over the years. He doesn't even really make good films anymore, but there are people that are devoted to watching Nick Cage films because even in his worst films, you can watch and go, he's going to do something very strange. <laughs> he's going to have a couple of moments where you just go, holy shit, that's the Nick Cage I love. Because he just, he can't help himself. He just is such... Uh, it kind of maybe it, he's just such a ham, you know, he just loves knowing that anything's available to him. Where does an actor find that freedom? Uh, it's permission you got to give yourself. I was, I just watched a long form interview with Anthony Bourdain just yesterday, and he used an expression that I love, and I would say, pass it on to your students uninhibited creative freedom. They, it doesn't sound all that complicated, but those three words, when put together, really, um, can give you a lot of permission to realize why, why aren't we all uninhibited in our creative freedom? Mm. That's certainly a big reason why you should be going to acting class. There's the technical side of what we do and building a craft and understanding how to work for the camera and all these things that you and I can teach and help actors with so that they can audition better and self tape better. And then there's the stuff that's harder to teach, which is a permission to, for the actor just to say, you know what, it doesn't have to be a certain way. You don't for, for, for actors to always be thinking that they need to conform something in to fit something that casting directors or the producers or the showrunners are looking for is a very limited way to look at what they are looking for, which is an energy. They're looking for something that pops off of the screen with energy. It still has to be still so that we can see your eyes. Mm -hmm. So to suddenly start acting like a lunatic in your self tape and running around and going in and out of frame and doing wacky antics not going to do you any good because we need to see what's happening, right? With the storytelling. Right. That's right. But where you take your pauses, you know, you know, uh, where you decide to, to have an emotional outburst or some kind of emotional truth in the scene that maybe the scene says specifically, he, you know, her eyes missed up on this line. Well, what the writer is really getting at is there's an emotion that's happening here, but really you could, your eyes could missed up. You could, you could get really emotional anywhere in the scene and and you'd, and you'd be pr still getting pretty close to what the writer's going for so why not go for something that none of the actors are going to hit mm -hmm. none of the other actors are going to hit they're all going to play it very much by the book and do it exactly the way it's written in the script and try to reach that tearful moment on that beat but why not put it right at the top of the scene right and right. do something different with it 
and allow yourself the freedom to explore all the possibilities of the material. And it really is just the permission. And permission comes from um, overcoming fear, that the fear that you're doing something wrong. You know, this fear that you're not going to get the job because you didn't do what was, was supposed to be done and it wasn't what they were looking for. You have no idea what they're looking for. Right. <laughs> you really don't. Yeah. They, they, they put out what's called a breakdown and they have quotas. And yes, they need X amount of minorities and Caucasians and handicapped people and LGBTQ. Yes, all that's great. They have quotas now. There's nothing we can do about it. God bless them. Mm -hmm. That's the way the world is working right now. And, 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 and that's fine, right? Yeah. But they really don't know what they're looking for. Right. And they, they need actors to come in and provide energy and it needs to, it needs to pop off the screen. And when they look at it, they, they say, that's, that's what I want. I didn't know it until I saw it, but I like that. Yeah, yeah. And, but you got to come to life and you got to give yourself permission to be alive. And, and being a technical, still kind of static actor for the camera and your cell tapes is what, what I'm doing every Tuesday night with my actors is, is, is pointing that out to them that they're doing everything right, but it's very safe and it's very static. And you have to find a way to bring energy and urgency to everything we do. Mm. What do you, what do you find? Cause, cause you're, you're in the heart of it. You're in LA, you've been in LA forever. You're teaching actors, you're teaching actors of all different ages and all different abilities. Do you find a common a malady that that actors are suffering from or is everybody kind of coming from all different sorts of no, I do I do and it's why it's why we have to keep working as hard as we can to get to the the roots of Meisner and and which is why here even though I've shifted my focus with my Tuesday night group to really focus on audition technique and we're not doing scene study which I would prefer to do right working on the best scenes from Arthur Miller and, and Chekhov and the best scenes from film and TV and having deep dives and having actors work on something for a month where we can really explore the characters. Not right. doing that now. I'm doing audition technique with different material every week. When you're doing the other work, you can really work on the Meisner technique and, and work on how the words really come last. There's a lot of work to be done where the text or as Meisner says, the text is really just the canoe, right? You put the words in the canoe on page 115. It's the actor's job to provide the river underneath the canoe. And when you're doing scene study, you can really develop work habits with actors where they're going to push the text down the road and not be off book so quickly mm -hmm. and get a lot of the other work done, physical work, um, character work, backstory work, shared memory work, if it's a relationship, a husband and wife, a father, son, mother, daughter, they're doing the work that's going to really inform the scene mm. and then work on the lines later as you get more and more of the cement board, right? Mm. In auditions, the malady I have with all my actors is all they're hung up on is knowing their lines. That's all they're concerned with is knowing their lines. And when I have actors that step in front of the camera and know their lines too well, either they come across robotic because they know their lines too well and they've rehearsed them in front of the mirror and they're not malleable. There's no, the adjustments are not going to come easily to them because they can't unhear the way they've rehearsed it in their own head in their bathroom, yeah. or they know them so well that they freeze up and forget them because what they know are lines in a, in, in a, in a script or in text, but they don't know what the lines really are, which is a collection of details and a collection of references and a collection of story points. A lot of it, times it's boring exposition and procedural television, but really it's a collection of, in, of details and information. And you're telling a story with those details. And I should be able to say at any point to you, Josh, okay, so stop what you're doing here. Tell me your daughter's name. How old is she? What school does she go to, right? What time was she supposed to be picking? And if these are all plot points that are in the script, you should be able to answer all of those questions mm -hmm. as the grieving father, right? Oh, well, her name's Kathy, you know, Catherine, she's age eight. She was supposed to be picked up at three o'clock and you know, the driver wasn't there and the driver's name is Leonard and he drives a black sedan. All that is in the text. But if you just memorize the lines and I stop you and ask you those things, you're not going to know any of the answers to those questions. Right. Because all you know them is how they fit in the line. Right. But they're, they're story details. And you should be able to break the story down, day, down and tell the story in any number of ways. And once you can do that, now go back and say it the way that the writer wanted you to say it. And now you're telling a story. Mm. But every actor, for the most part, comes in and, and the, the bulk of the work they put in is knowing their lines. I've, I've gotten to a point, and we've had this conversation many times, 
when I do my cell tapes, I, I get my material. I look it over quickly I, I, to make an assessment of what I'm in for. Okay, this is going to be an emotional lift. I can see what's happening here. I'm a grieving father. Wow, five pages. Okay, there's some work to be done here. This is going to be a heavy lift. Okay, and then I'll put it aside. Or this one's going to come in and go, okay, I get this. He's a, this is a detective. There's not going to be a much room for any emotional life here. It's going to be a lot of uh, expositional Q&A, interrogation. I'm barely going to look at this one. The next day, let's say, let's say I'm going to self-tape the next day. I'll get up the next morning and I will freehand that material. I'll take the material that I got and I'll write it out in a Sharpie on, in my own writing onto a blank piece of paper so that I can have the words put on the page exactly how I want. So I could condense maybe five pages to three. Mm. I can put the spaces where I want. I can get rid of the stupid ellipses if I think it's going to trip me up. I can put things in big, bold letters if I know I want this word just to, while I'm writing it, I can go, oh, I'm going to emphasize that word in this sense. I'm not going to emphasize the one that they underlined. I think I'm going to emphasize this one. So I'll underline that one, forgetting that they made, that they underlined the other one. Totally dismissing that because I've made a choice already with the text that I think the line will work different, work more specifically for me by emphasizing this word. So I write it all out in, in black Sharpie for myself. And then oftentimes I'll, I'll read it a couple more times and I won't look at it again until I get to my self tape. I will not spend any time getting off book on my text. I'll look at it enough to know that I know the story that I'm going to tell. If someone were to press me on the details, I could tell you the, the pertinent details of what I'm talking about, the names, the places, right? What happened, you know, where, where the abduction occurred, you know, Chinatown or Koreatown. Right. Right. And then I'm going to go to the, the self tape session director and while he's setting up his camera because i still pay to have all mine done professionally i don't like to do them myself yeah i still go and have, have my editor in burbank do it i run the lines with him two or three times while he's setting up the lights right he has a script in his hand i have the script in my hand once we've run it two or three times i'm basically off book right on and then i and then we shoot it right on and the first the first one might be a little clunky because I'm, I'm piecing together the beats right by the yep. second or third take um i'm right where I need to be. And I rarely do more than four or five takes at the very most, usually by the third or fourth take, I'm walking away. That's great. I, I, yeah. I have so many students who will put two hours into a two or yeah. three page scene and it's like, Oh God, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. It's know? very hard to unnail that. Yeah. It's, it's I spent funny. a lot of time. I spent a lot of time pulling nails out. Right. Who, uh, what actors just, float your boat do you just watch and you're just like oh man i eat that well, up uh, i brought up two of the best already we, you know the, the late great phil hoffman i could watch i could watch his work uh, over and over again a variety of films from doubt to talented mr ripley uh, uh savages um until the devil knows uh, uh, you're dead um Magnolia. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis is in a league of his own. I used to really love watching Russell Crowe when he was hitting his stride. Right now, Christian Bale is really great. Mm. He, he just he rarely um, he rarely turns in anything that isn't really inspired. Um, I like Ryan Gosling. I like stuff that I love. I love the new Blade Runner. I, I think he's oh, very yeah. good. I think he's very good at doing very little. Yeah. And letting the camera come and visit his thoughts. I think he's very, very good at that. Oh, Elizabeth Moss, who graduated from Mad Men and then went on to Handmaid's Tale, mm -hmm. is just an exceptional actor. She's got real in, intense depth to her work. And she goes for the jugular, as Meisner likes to say. She's not afraid to really get, to get uh, dirty with her work. Um, always love watching Viola Davis just because the depth in her eyes. I mean, the work that she did and Chad Bozeman and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom was just spectacular. Mm. The depth uh, and the just the uh, the poetry that they found in that material. Uh, I loved watching Chad Bozeman. I could watch Viola Davis in anything. Yeah. Um, Kate Blanchett is always good. She she pops up in very interesting projects. She was in an, she was in an Aussie show that I saw recently. I didn't know she'd done called Stateless. Huh with uh oh uh, Ivan Strahovski yeah is in stateless and it's a oh. great great show with Dominic West and Kate Blanchett run this kind of cult and and uh, Ivan Strahovski is this flight attendant who's kind of the black sheep of her family and her parents are disappointed that she hasn't settled down and gotten married and her sister's doing all the right things and she's just kind of floundering 
and she makes her way to this kind of motivational speaker played by Dominic West. And it turns out to be this cult and she gets brainwashed and suddenly she gets caught up in this thing and it becomes, she loses her mind and gets her passport stolen and ends up in this, uh, in a refugee camp that's all Muslims, potential, potential Muslim terrorists. And she's this woman who stole it. Uh, anyway, it's a very elaborate story. It's called Stateless uh, and the work in it is exceptional. So I brought that up because Kate Blanchett pops up in the show and she's just, as always, uh, exceptional. So there's a handful of actors that I really admire right now. Yeah. Um, you know, Marlon Brando will always be my ultimate. I've, yeah. I've watched some Brando recently. I was just watching him in one of his more obscure performances that no one ever re ever references from a film called The Ugly American, hmm. uh, which is a very political story about a fictitious uh, 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 kind of Taiwanese country dealing with their own revolution. And, and Brando's character is the um, ambassador. And there's one moment in particular where he's drinking rice wine with this guy who's leading the revolution. And they're old friends from from their war days. They had a they have a, a bonding history, right? And they're drinking this rice wine, and Brando takes a hit of the rice wine, and it's really strong, right? So instead of just playing the fact that it's strong and giving like a stereotypical kind of oh shit, maybe a, you know a couple of deep breaths, maybe pound the chest, like oh that's some strong shit, he just starts playing the piano on the table. There's a <laughs> table in front of him. He just, Brando just starts going bang 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 like he's playing the piano. And then he comes up and starts to pound his chest and he's looking at the guy going, whoo. And you just know that that wasn't in the script. <laughs> you know that that was just Brando in the moment, just letting himself do whatever the hell he would do when he's bonding with an old friend and just took a hit of something that was super strong. That's what I mean by permission. That's a Nicolas Cage kind of permission. And I guarantee you, Cage, Cage is a huge Brando fan. Oh. Brando is, uh, Brando's, uh, is the GOAT, without a doubt. Yeah. So for, for your students, if they have not seen On the Waterfront, A Streetcar Named Desire, mm -hmm. Last Tango in Paris, obviously The Godfather, mm -hmm. um, but A Streetcar Named Desire and, and On the Waterfront are, um, are, are a must watch for anyone who really wants to understand what this art form can be at its at its at its pinnacle. What do you. If you were to, to boil it all down, what do you love about this work? I love uh, the emotional connection that's available to us by the artist getting inside of the text. So first the writer had to get inside the text and tell a personal story, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. First the writer did it. And then the, the actor gets to grab a hold of it and make it his or her own and mine it for the most truth and depth that that actor can get after the writer has given it his or her most truth. Now the actor gets to apply it. And then the cinematographer gets to choose the right lens and light it the right way. And then the editor gets to find the best moments that the director managed to get out of you. And then you get to put a piece of music together. All of that collaboration and maybe, not maybe, but more often than not, someone's gonna get goosebumps watching it or maybe have a, a, a realization or, or a, a breakthrough in their own emotional life of understanding, of empathy. Um, all of that is available to us pretty consistently in this art form. Um, now, whether or not we get to do it in an Oscar winning film or we get to do it in a, an AFI short film or in an off Broadway play, or maybe just in acting class, it's still worth exploring and to be in search constantly of that collaboration of grabbing great text, making your own, putting all of your, your emotional depth and life and vulnerability and intellectual understanding and your own substitutes or your own imagination, packing all that in and you coming up with the goods to communicate it through the camera mm. is awesome. And I know I'm very good at it. You're very good at it. It takes a lot of work to get good at it because you need to be able to do it in the professional world. You need to be able to do it when the machinery is all around you and when maybe the work conditions weren't ideal and maybe you did just break for lunch and maybe it's not, maybe things on set are not lining up for you perfectly you need to block all that out and when they say action you need to crush the shit out of it and make sure that you've got all of that working for you all of your emotional availability and vulnerability is, is working from your from your instrument and um, to get good at that and to do it under the pressure of the machinery with the, with the lights on you um, and the producers knowing that they've got to make their day and you've got to deliver awesome awesome 
and it's 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 a it's a very fun thing to be good at. It sure is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just ask us. We'll tell you. It, it sure is. Well, the, the, the alternative is to go in and, and book a job and it's your turn and you, you come up short and it doesn't go well. And it doesn't work. And you, they're slowing down and you can tell that they're going to maybe make a compromise and go, you know, the, this, this dreaded kind of feeling of, oh, well, we don't really got it, but let's just move on. They're not going to say that, but sometimes you can feel it. You know, let's just move on. <laughs> you know, you, you don't ever want to feel like they're going to go, well, shit, I don't think this guy or this, this young lady is ever going to really give us what we need. So let's just cut our losses and move on to the next shot. And so, to know that, yeah, keep going, keep going. No, but to, to know that that's not, you know, that you're going to be locked in. And of course, there's going to be moments when we're, when we're not at our, at the top of our game, but for the most part to work consistently in TV, man, uh, they, they need to have confidence in the actor that they're hiring that you can step in as a guest star and and knock that shit out in a couple of takes. So we've, I think many of us, I know, I know I have had those moments where I didn't do my work. Yeah. And or for whatever reason, I did my work, but something came along and just took me out at the knees. Yeah. And the camera's right there. And I wasn't yeah. able to deliver the way I wanted to deliver. You we've yeah. talked about this before. Yeah. What? When did that happen to you, or has that happened to you? In a oh yeah. Well, I I don't think I don't think I shared this with you, but it was about a year and a half, year and a half ago, which I mean, it's not long ago. And I'm you know now that I'm teaching and you know I again kind of position myself as I know what I'm talking about and <laughs> I have I have the answers on how to make this stuff work. You know, then suddenly you find yourself. I, I was working opposite uh, Brie Larson and Michael B. Jordan in a film called Just Mercy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just did the master shot. And we knew that, you know, the film, the, the scene was basically going to be covered in a two shot and, and then alternating singles. It was, that's, it was a little triangular scene. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they shot the master so that we could run it a couple of times. And then they moved in and they went right to my close up. And usually they cover the stars first. But because of the way the lighting was set up, they got to my close up first. And um, I knew my lines. I knew what was going on. We just did the master, probably three takes. And we did the master and it was fine. And we got to my close up. And once they said action, I, I looked at Brie Larson and I looked at Michael B. Jordan and I was overcome with this sense of, wow, these are two of the biggest young stars in the world. <laughs> they both have amazingly electric eyeballs that are staring right through me. And I just forgot anything I was supposed to say. I just started kind of babbling. I just kind of fumbled out a couple of words and fumbled out a couple more syllables and basically my, my lips were just kind of going blah, 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 blah. and I realized I was totally starstruck by these two like 30 somethings as a 50 at the time 53 year old actor going shit man I'm supposed to be better than this these are just a couple of kids but they're literally two of the biggest stars in the world and in that moment their star power eyeballs both of them looking at me threw me off my game for a second so I stepped aside the director was great came over and said Ah, he didn't, you know, he just basically distracted me with something else to get me talking about something and said, yeah, I'll try it this way, try it this way, let's do it again. I said, yeah, he just needed to pull me aside. I just needed to go collect myself. So that wasn't very professional. Um, but I can't remember anything else in recent years. Definitely nothing, nothing where I dropped out, lost my way and wasn't able to get back. Mm. Didn't have any of those. I, I, I can't remember having anything like that. Um, so I don't know if that qualifies. That was really just one take, one moment on a big A-list film with with major stars, and I suddenly was fanboy. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was, uh, it was bad. What did they do? I, 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 nothing I could do. I didn't see it coming. I didn't plan for it. It was just <laughs> action. And I, they were no longer the characters they were playing. I was going, shit, you know, it's, it's like Captain Marvel and Black Panther guy, and uh, <laughs> holy shit. What do I what do I do with these two? Yeah. I'm just going to stand here for a second and hope that you know I say something coherent. So so how do you how do you pull yourself back from that precipice? Uh, just get, lock back in, come back out, and, and focus. Stanislavski point of focus. You come back in, you find something else, a lapel, something on his jacket. Focus on the shaking of the hands. You reduce it to something small within the scene that can bring your focus so that your third eye stops looking at you and saying, wow, you're doing this scene with these two big stars. Mm. You know, you take the props that you have and you give them a little more personal ownership. 
you, you, you get connected to physical things that are in your control that are smaller. Mm. So, I mean, it's classic Stanislavski and you just, and you just really put your focus and your gaze on that. And then everything else falls into line after that. And then the scene starts. And then to be honest, once the scene got going, my, when my stuff was in the can, we moved to Michael's, uh, uh, Michael B. Jordan's single. And he had a couple of tongue twisters that he could not get. Mm. And he kept messing up his lines and he kept messing them up. Take after take, he couldn't say a couple of things. And finally, a uh, uh, camera's going to reload or a new battery. Or there was a, suddenly there was a lull in the action. And I pulled him aside. I said, Michael, we haven't, we've barely run these lines. I said, let's go back here into this hall. We were in like a, a school. Let's go back in this hallway and let's run the lines a few times and really listen to each other and connect with each other. And the lines are going to make more sense to both of us. He said, oh, man, I'd love to. It couldn't have been cooler. And we went back and we first we did a couple of Italian jobs where we just ran the lines fast. And then we slowed him down. And I literally for a couple of moments started talking to him like I would a student. And I said, great. Now let's just look at each other and say the words really slowly and make sure that we understand what we're saying to each other. And we did it a couple more times and he totally locked in. Beautiful. So that was. Yeah. And he was very appreciative because I don't think anyone really takes the time to, he, he might have an acting coach, but I, he's probably not used to, um, you know, an actor that's in my role in that capacity, pulling him aside and saying, here's what we should do to get on track. And it worked. He, he, overcome, he, he was able to get the words out and well, make sense of them. What I found is, is, is so great is that when you're on set, when you're in those situations, very often, you know, they're, those actors are very often your biggest fans because yeah. they want to get in there with you. They want to dance. Yeah. They want to yeah. play in the sandbox. So if if they can help in some way, they are more than happy to do that to the to the best of their abilities. You know, it yeah. really, I love that communal. We're a family. We're in this war together. I've yeah. got your back. I've got your six forward ho. You know. Good. Did you have a lot? Of, you must have had a lot of. Uh, uh exchanges like that with brendan gleason did you was he that kind of actor that liked to work with you and get in there you know brendan's interesting because um you know we would cut and he would just kind of he was he's a pretty quiet guy that doesn't uh, surprise me yeah he's just this big kind of teddy bear of a guy and <laughs> and we we had one scene that was like six pages it was him and jerell jerome and me and it was mostly brendan and me and Jarrell had already been nominated for the for the Emmy, so it was like, whoa, I've I've got some serious ballers here, and uh, and we we cut and we reset, and I look at Brendan, and Brendan looks at me, and he goes, ah, it's good, yeah, yeah, and I'm like, I sure should hope so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's awesome, yeah, he was very, you know, he he's Irish, so he's working class, like. Yeah. There's no doesn't there's, overthink it. No, no. I mean, I mean, he does what he's got to do to get there and he gets there. Yeah. Um, but it, it, yeah, he's very he's very low key. And and uh, but yeah, there were so many other actors that that I would get to talk with and we get to, you know, really yeah. chew the fat. Let me let me ask you something early on. You know, we all have different influences in our training life. In, in, in laying the foundation for this life, who was supportive to you? Who really, who really championed you? Who really encouraged you and, and, and just kept, kept saying, go, Johnny, go? Hmm. Uh, no one that you would know. I had a couple of teachers early on. One guy in particular that I was ironically waiting tables with, who was an actor that had never had any professional success at all but he was well trained and he was I wouldn't he was not Juilliard trained but he was classically trained and, and was versed in Shakespeare and and had all the knowledge that I thought I was certainly lacking when I first got to town coming from a sports journalism background and Hawaii and being a jock and not having any formal training this guy um, had all of that but he had no professional success to speak of so he had nothing to pound his chest about, but he clearly knew what the hell he was talking about, right? And he took an interest in me, um, was perplexed and impressed that I was already booking things because it, he, he had, hadn't had any success, but he saw that I needed a foundation and I needed to work. And he's the one that pulled me aside 
and then put me together with another five actors maybe and started doing Meisner training. And that was the beginning of my Meisner training. And Stuart, his name was Stuart Schreiber. And Stuart was very good at teaching it and, and reducing it down to the basics and doing repetition and activity work. And like I said, at, at no time were there ever probably more than half a dozen actors in our class. Mm. And we would do it very informally at different locations. But he stayed on me and, and gave me books, gave me books on Brando and, and the Actors Studio and Harold Clerman and uh, A Method to Their Madness, which became a book that I really was, was a real Bible of mine to learn about Stella Adler and Ellen Burstyn and Eli Wallach and all the teachers that were working at the Actors Studio, Estelle Parsons. Um, and Stuart gave me a lot of that. Just he really kind of took me under his wing and made sure that I had an understanding of um, the work that came out of New York and how it informs everything we do, wow. um, which, again, is back to Stanislavski, the group theater, uh, Strasberg, Stella Adler uh, and, and Sandy Meisner and all of that without an understanding of that's where this work came from, mm. from that that Algonquin round table of of thespians and acting teachers in the 50s in, in, in lower Manhattan, that's where all this started. And Stewart insisted that I know that and that I learn that and that I read up on it and that I become a Meisner actor. And I, I learned so much from him and I haven't spoken to or been in touch with him in 25 years. I have no idea what he's doing. I know for a fact he's not in the industry mm. because he never really was in the industry. He was just a really well-trained, well-intended, really good actor who saw something in me and decided I needed, I needed to know a few things. So that was almost like a guardian angel. Wow. Yeah. So for those folks who are new to this and kind of think that, uh, that Hollywood started all this stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, go back to those, go back to that foundation, the Stanislavski. Yeah, well, you know, it was what, what they were doing with that. It was called the group theater in, in uh, the early, early 50s, late, late 40s. In, in, and then the playwright, uh, Clifford Odets, the playwright, Eugene O'Neill. These people were all part of this, this, this group called The Group. And it was Harold Clerman and Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg and, uh, and Cheryl Crawford and Sandy Meisner. And uh, this touring group from Moscow came over and, and, and did some performances that they, that they witnessed and they were blown away by this, totally, this touring. Totally, these Russians totally, totally blown terrible. away by this Russian, this Russian troop that came over and they decided to uh, the four significant ones, Clerman, Adler, Strasberg, and Meiser decided to go study with Stanislavski in Moscow. Wow. And they went over there and spent concerted time with them and, Learned a lot watching the process and watching the, the, the productions from the seagull to the cherry orchard. And then they came back and uh, there were two camps. And there was the method camp that was Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg, which is sense memory, mm-hmm. which is if you've never lived it, if you don't really have it as, as something that you can physically and emotionally relate to, then you can't play acting. And if you don't have it, you need to find a way to go get it before you can portray it and display it. Mm-hmm. Method acting. People think of the examples of method acting. The, the ones that people like to point to is Robert De Niro. Before he did Taxi Driver, he became a taxi driver for six months and drove around uh, Manhattan as a taxi driver. And now he was qualified to play Travis Bickle, right? That's right. method acting. Daniel Day-Lewis, you know, for a year, you could not, in, in anyone that knew Daniel Day-Lewis for a year while he was making Lincoln, called him Mr. President. Right. He was in character for the better part of 16 months making that film method acting. He was, he's, he was going to stay in character. So there's all this witchcraft surrounding method acting and its mythology. And Stella Adler and uh, Lee Strasberg were convinced that sense memory was the way to go. Sanford Meisner heard something different. He said, everything you're saying is right, but also you're allowed to use your imagination when you don't have something to pull from. Mm-hmm. And Meisner said, how can a 20 something, and he would use obscure uh, references like Gina Lola Brigida, he says, if a 20 something your actor, you know, has to have, a, you know, a pretend he's in a love affair with Gina Lola Brigida, how is he going to possibly have that? He's never, he doesn't have that life experience. All he can do is imagine what it would be like to be with a woman of that caliber of beauty. So right. the imagination then has to take form because how could a 20 year old possibly have that life experience? So he would use obscure re- references like that. But his point was, imagination is endless. Right our own personal toolbox, that which we can pull back from our darkest 
demons of when we were four years old and locked in a closet or seven years old and were left off of a birthday party guest list. And how did that feel? All the stuff that we do in method acting classes to get back in touch with sense memories that we've maybe hidden and deprived ourselves of. Right. Smizer said, okay, do that, but make sure you're not shortchanging the imagination. Mm -hmm. And he ran with that. And Stanislavski came around later and said, Meisner's right. I, you guys, uh, I've come around to it also. And my, my imagination is far more um, powerful and not to be neglected. Yeah. Wow. So we, wow. we, 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 we picked the right horse. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think every actor needs an understanding of those luminaries for sure. Yeah. Harold Clerman was Harold Clerman was the head of the head of the group. Cheryl Crawford is one that people most often forget about. But the big teachers that came out of it were, you know, uh, Stella and, and Lee Strasberg and, and Meisner. Uta Hagen is another one that comes along, but she came along later. Ellen Burstyn. Most people know of Ellen Burstyn as a, just a phenomenal, you know, Oscar winning actress, but great teacher, as was uh, Eli Wallach as was Estelle Parsons, who was great in, in Bonnie and Clyde. So these actors that people know of uh, don't realize how great they were in the actor's studio mm -hmm. and teaching people like Marilyn Monroe and Clint Eastwood and James Dean and Martin Brando and uh, Martin Landau. All these people were, had really great teachers. Um, and they all just really were committed to the work, man. Really committed to just deep, emotionally impactful storytelling. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I know, fun stuff, huh? I love it. I I, I love yeah. the history of it because it's so it's so unique, you know. Like acting yeah. is such a unique thing, and it's and it's and yet it's so ubiquitous. You know, we we all oh, yeah. to a certain degree every day of our lives. Yeah, and yet uh, it's it, the study of it, the understanding of it, is such a specific thing you know it's yeah uh, and it's uh, and, and so on the one hand it's um everyone has thought at some point for the most part there's exceptions to every rule it's it's the one career where most people have thought i wonder if i could do that mm. i mean you watch a baseball game you know, i wonder if i could throw a 100 mile an hour fastball I'm pretty sure you can't and you, you know if you could right. or you know I, I, not not everyone has thought about maybe being an architect right, right? But everyone kind of has thought, I wonder if I could, you know, if I could have done that, if I could be that. And it's very, very few careers, I think you can say that that applies to people. Right. So there's that, there's this thinking that people think, I think I could do that. And then there's really doing it. Right. And then there's getting to a point where, wow, it's much harder than I thought. Therefore, it's got to be like witchcraft. There's got to be some kind of magic bullet or some kind of potion that these people drink to do it. And that's what I hope it's kind of what you're enjoying about the work with what Meisner put in place for us is it's not, it's really, it's a playbook. Right. That's why I've had great success in, in teaching athletes, in particular pro athletes, uh, the Meisner technique, because athletes love playbooks. Meisner gives us a playbook. Mm -hmm. It starts with repetition. Repetition is very basic. It relies on a couple of elements that you listen to each other and repeat, that you not ask questions and try to create something that's entertaining but that you're present in the moment and, and Meisner knows that you're at least listening by the fact that you've repeated it because if you didn't hear it, you couldn't repeat it. So you start with these building blocks. So first I must hear you, I'm repeating it. And then it starts to evolve. And now what am I feeling? What are the impulses we're getting? As you and I do the repetition, I'm feeling something from you. And if I can label it, that's great. Ah, you just, I just broke through and you just made an understanding. That, not, not, that was a deeper understanding that you just had right there. And we start to feel what's happening moment to moment. OK, it's a building block. And then you realize, well, every scene can't be a conversation because if every scene is reduced to two actors staring at each other and having that kind of intense uh, complicity with each other, that's not the way storytelling works. Nothing can sustain that kind of directness. Right. And it's so not just the way life works. It's, it's not at all. Exactly. And I tell my actors all the time, as soon as a scene becomes a conversation, it's boring. Writers don't write conversations. They write conflicts. They write. Um, they write, um, you know, um, interrogations, they write deflections and evasive tactics, but rarely is it just two people conversing. And if it is, it's not really worth filming. Right. But Meisner knows that. So then after the repetition, he layers in independent activities so that we can learn to throw our energy into something else. I've got a notepad. I've got a checkbook. I've got some dishes that I'm doing while we're talking. And now it's less of a conversation because my energy is coming up from the activity. I'm hearing you because I'm trained in repetition to always be hearing you. Mm -hmm. But my energy is also going into my activity. 
which is throwing my energy elsewhere. And now it's becoming a scene because it has energy. And it's not just two people staring at each other like mental patients. Mm -hmm. So Meister is giving us these great building blocks to build on. And it's a playbook. So it's not witchcraft. You yeah. listen. You, you, you work off of impulses instead of cues. You use an activity when you can to throw your energy somewhere. You always know what to do with your hands because your hands generate energy. Mm. You know, actors are always looking for what to do with their hands. And once you find often how to sit, how to lean, what to do with your hands, the character falls into place because you find a comfort and you can start to you can start to respond from your gut because you don't have any physical tension. We have a lot of physical tension when we're working as actors. And when we do that, we're blocking ourselves. And often it's because we don't know what to do with our limbs. Right. We don't know how to, we don't, we, we're always looking for something to lean on. You're a great leaner. <laughs> yeah. I'm a great leaner. <laughs> yeah. You, you're, you're very good at finding things to lean on. <laughs> actors, that's important, man. That's yeah. very important. Yeah. I, I guess I am kind of a leaner. You're good. No, it's, it's good. It's a, it's a compliment. Well, thank I mean, you. that means you understand how you work best and every actor is looking for something to do physically. Once you find what to do physically, yeah, the scene falls into place. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I, it, it really I, does because then you can settle into it. You can settle yeah. into the environment. Yep. It, it changes everything. It does. And, and often it's overlooked in the process. Mm. And I see actors, they know their lines, but I can just tell physically they're not comfortable. So all I do is make an adjustment with how they're sitting, how they're crossing their legs, what are they doing with their hands? And, and, and I do it in front of their, their peers and in the class and the whole class can watch them transform from not feeling comfortable to feeling comfortable. And the whole class goes, wow, you just found the character by the way you're sitting now. Mm. And the actor gets to go, yeah, well, 15 other people just recognize that the energy of in the room changed as soon as I sat a certain way. Mm. Now the character's there. Now run the scene and you go, it starts to flow. Mm. But when we're not comfortable, when we don't know what to do with our appendages, we're, we're just, we're always looking for something to, you know, that's why actors love props. Yeah. That's why Brad you know? Pitt's always eating something or somebody smoking yeah. or, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very, very, uh, you know, uh, it lets you off the hook when, when you have something to do with your hands. What... Uh... When did you realize that there is no magic bullet? I think just in my, in my continue, uh, in my serious application of Meisner, because I, because I, I chose about eight years ago, Josh, to really, to really give this my full attention that I, I knew that I could teach my, both my parents are teachers. It's something that comes naturally to me. I, I, so I grew up in an environment where teaching and then that outreach is, is honorable and noble. Mm -hmm. So I, I have that naturally. And I said, if I, I know for a fact, let's, here's something and I, and I don't want to uh, disparage anyone at all. So I'm not going to name any names, but so many of my actors that I first came into contact with in the beginning of my career, in the beginning uh, of the nineties, friends, people that I'd be hanging out with um, just my social scene. Mm -hmm. several of them were splintering off and doing these two-year Meisner programs. Uh, and right around that time, this is when Stuart Schreiber, my friend, pulled me aside and I was doing it kind of a la carte on the side. Mm -hmm. But I knew that several of my, my, my uh, contemporaries and my peers were doing these full commitment two-year Meisner programs. There's several schools in town that, that offer this. Yeah. And it's laid out as a two-year program. And there's a lot of rules to what they expect of you. One of them, I think, is even it used to be that you're not supposed to take professional work during those two years because you're not ready for it. There were all sorts of things. Uh, and, and just the, the, the way the repetition was laid out and then the independent activity stage was laid out. And they finally got to Spoon River Anthologies as a monologue. And it was just like, like this long two-year playbook of how Meisner was supposed to be taught to a person. And I do not exaggerate, to a person every one of those friends of mine that took some form of the Meisner program in, in one of those various schools dropped out of acting, quit acting. Went and did something else maybe in the industry. One's a very notable casting director that you, knows you very well. Um, mm -hmm. And other people, they, they just, they dropped out. My point is the two-year program, the way it was being taught, and I think still is being taught in a lot of places, drains the enthusiasm out of it. It's, it's very tedious to spend four months on independent activity exercises. 
and and to, to, to for repetition to be something that you do all class for three hours instead of as a calisthenic, which is the way we do, which is just to get us dropping in lightning round of repetition and get everyone feeling present in the room. Now let's go do our work. Right. And I realized eight years ago that I knew what the nuts and bolts and the bite sized chunks were of Meisner and that I could take it and demystify it and strip it away from that two year regiment that was draining the, the life out of so many of the friends that I saw mm-hmm. in the beginning of my career. And I could make Meisner user friendly mm-hmm. and get to just the real uh, the core of what he was going for with repetition and activity work and how that applies to everything that we do mm-hmm. and make it user-friendly, accessible and bite-sized and make it fun mm-hmm. and make it um, something I could teach and get results. That's the best thing. It wouldn't work if I wasn't getting results. Right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, I would not have the confidence to speak the way I speak now. Right. And I only pat myself on the back because I know that I've made it fun for my actors because I, I get that type of validation and feedback. But again, it's all because it's in the book, man. It's in the book. It's all it's all in here. Hold that book up close to the camera because I, I mean that thing is so dog-eared and yeah. so beaten to hell. Oh yeah. How long have you had that particular copy and what number since, copy is that? Yeah, no, this is the only one. I mean, I've I've given away many, but this is since 1989, probably 1990. It's just it's got it all in there, man. My goodness. Right? What more do you need to know than that? Fullness. <laughs> in a word. That's great. That's what we're looking for. It's all That's in the book, man. And I, and that and again, it gets me off the hook. I, you know, I, again, I'm not going to name names, but there are these acting teachers in LA and New York that have great cachet to their, to their name and people drop their names and they're supposed to people assume that just by studying with that person, fill in the blank. We all know who I'm talking about. Then you're going to go, wow, then you must be great. If you study with that person. Right. Genuflect. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it's like this cocktail party kind of, right. oh, I'm studying with so-and-so and, and the, the, uh, the desired effect of that comment is, well, that must mean then that you're really talented because that's a great teacher. Right. I've just always known that if you're working with one of those teachers, you're probably not getting the attention you deserve. Mm. It's much more personal than that. You're mm. probably one of you know, 500, 300 that's in that school. And there's, there's, I'm sure there's benefits to it. And there's some, some wonderful stuff that you're learning, right. but you're not getting what we're, what we're doing, which is much more hands-on in the trench with the actor. And also those acting teachers for the most part. And I think almost exclusively, they're not still in the game. They're not doing what we do. And they, most of them never were. Mm. They never were professional actors. Most of the real household name teachers out in LA and uh, I, I don't begrudge them any of their success. I just know for a fact, um, I offer the I, I offer a young actor or an actor that's looking to make a career shift. I offer a lot more because I know I'm going to get in there personally with that actor and help them break down their obstacles and get to where they want to go as a storyteller. Yeah. And I just don't see that happening at any of those places where they're going to get that kind of personal attention. So. Um, very proud of that because I know I care about all the actors that come into my studio and give them, you know, every, every ounce of my energy and, and, and knowledge and wisdom to, to help them succeed. Absolutely. I, I tell my actors, I say, I, I want my actors to be the workingest actors in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. I love, love that. Celebrating their successes. I just, it, 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 it we had, a success. I know it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You want to have these bra- you want to have these brag boards, right? So and so got a call back. So and so got a so and so booked. I, I've never done that where it's where it's something, but I do bring up at the, at the beginning of class each week if there's a certain if there's success that's happening with with certain actors. I like to acknowledge it and let everyone feel the 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 kind of the communal joy in that. Yeah, and, and the the fear, of course, when you do that, Josh, and you know this very well, is for the actors that aren't working, they're going to have this sense of why. Why aren't I? When, when do I get to have my moment? And you have to be very conscious of that and, and make sure that you're pulling everyone along for the ride and saying your work is coming, but you have you really have to stay the course. There's there's room for everybody. You are. I like to tell my actors that you are the answer to a casting director's problem. That's right. You know, so somewhere there's a casting director that just needs your thumbnail to show up on their computer and they'll go, wow, I've never met her. I've never met him. I need to meet this actor. So how do you do that? You've got to go on what I call an awareness campaign. You have to find ways to get your your product, your 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 brand, 
mm-hmm. in front of these people. Usually it's with an agent, but there are a lot of ways to do it now that we didn't have available when we started out. There's a lot of ways to kind of get content out there. You know, your own, your own YouTube channel is something that you're doing with social media. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at what Broderick did with that short film. I don't know if you watched that short film that he made, but that got him, that got him, that got him a job on the terminal list because he made sure that the writer of the terminal list saw it. And uh, yeah, Broderick, and it worked. He got, he got a day's work on it opposite Chris Pratt. Oh, right. He made it, he he made a short film and he made it. I mean, he did such a bang up job. It's a really professional film. Wow. Yeah. You should check it out. It's really good. I will. I will. It's called fathers and sons. Okay. Well that, that's my alley. Yep. Big time. All right. Here's one for you. And this is, this is a, not necessarily a professional question, but it's, it's a creative question. Mm -hmm. Do you listen to jazz? Oh my goodness. Yes. Why? Uh, Because I love uh, the unpredictability. I love the, I love its lack of structure. Uh-huh. within within the structure i'm a big coltrane fan i spent a big part of uh the my the first six months of quarantine while i was finishing rosebud lane the script w- with uh two miles davis albums that i played every morning what'd you play yeah uh, uh, uh the, the, the bitches brew when i wanted when i when i when i needed something to um to jump start when i didn't know what the idea was yeah right and when I knew when I knew what I was when I knew what I was going to write, and I just needed to go down that path, uh, kind of blue. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. But when I, when I didn't when I didn't know what I was going to write, when I when I was kind of not stuck, but I needed a spark, I would put on Bitches Brew, and it would take me to these places that I wasn't expecting. Oh yeah. yeah. And I just was okay. I, I didn't I didn't I didn't expect to feel that way right now. Now it, it freed up some 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 inspiration that I didn't know was there. Um, but I love Giant Steps. I love Love Supreme. Um, oh. Arnett Coleman. I love, uh, if I'm in the mood, I love Billie Holiday. Yeah. Um, who else? Charlie Parker. Yeah. Yep. 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 The Every reason- now and then, you know, a little, uh, little uh, uh, Count Basie. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, Good you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge jazz fan. And yeah. uh, I, have- I know you love Miles. Oh, boy, do I. Um, and I've actually used kind of blue to kind of show my students the difference between each soloist. Yeah. That I think jazz is actually really, really perfect for this craft that here we are, we're all agreed upon what we're going to do. We're going to play this song. Mm-hmm. We're all gonna, you're going to play your part. I'm going to play my part. They're going to jive just like this. This is going to be beautiful. And then You've got an opportunity to say whatever the hell it is you want to say yeah. in these 64 bars. Yeah. And that's when you need to be you. Yeah. You don't need to be me. Good. You need to be as much you as you can possibly be. And, and I just love the, the freedom in that. Yeah. Freedom, like you said, within the, within the framework. Uh, the the lack of structure within the structure, yeah. And the ability for each artist to say what they want to say, yeah. And say it at a hundred percent, and then come back to supporting the other artist who's going to say what he or she wants to say it. And that's the key right there is the generosity of knowing when to hand it off. Yes, that's what I love about jazz is when you're really when you're really uh, meditating on it and listening to it is the handoffs. Yeah, and you can feel it coming. You know. If, and the, the solo is winding down and you can start to hear that, you know, the, the stand of the cello or the, or the sax about to creep in. And then you just feel it handed off and you just know, oh man, that was, that was gorgeous. And now this new artist is going to take it into a different realm maybe. Yeah. And you know, it's the same songs so they're playing in the same key or whatever they're doing, but it's glorious, man. I love it. Yeah. Well, I, and miles, My, miles was amazing. You know, Miles has one of my favorite quotes. He says, uh, I mean, he's got a bunch of brilliant quotes. Um, but the one thing that I that I take a lot of comfort in is he says, uh, it took me a long time to figure out how to play like myself. Wow. Yeah, that's it, man. <laughs> well, that's so what is the, what is the uh, the um, platitude that we throw at actors? frequently and so many of them hate hearing it because they know it's true but they don't know what to do with it 
Mm-hmm. You're enough. Oh, right. That's, what, that's a, how, how often you want to say that to your actors. Stop acting. Stop yes. working so hard. Yes. You're enough. Yes. And in those two words, those two words, it's utter, It's almost like kind of a Steve Jobs, right? S- uh, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It's yeah. almost like the ultimate acting lesson. You're enough. Two words. And that's what it means is there's only one you. Do the best you you can do. I mean, Jeff Bridges is one of the most beloved, celebrated actors of the last 40, 50 years. And he jokingly will say he's really just basically made a career out of playing himself. You know, sure, he's played characters. I mean, the big Lebowski, I mean, uh, uh, Iron Man, yeah. uh, Star Man, he's played characters. But for the most part, he has found success by keeping things very close to home mm. and playing as close to Jeff Bridges as possible. Mm. And look at the career the guys had. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's when I watch your work, man, when I, st- when I see the stuff, you know what a fan I am of, of your work, but when I watch josh doherty at his best it's when you're it's when you're doing your thing man it's when you're just doing your thing and not pushing too hard to to try to be in some other lane because your lane's pretty damn good man stay in it and just tell that story it's a pretty good story well it's a it's a lesson that we all need to learn that you know everything that we've been through everything Mm -hmm. we've experienced our beliefs our relationships our heartbreaks it is enough yeah, because the human animal is the same no matter where you go. We've all felt the yeah. same things. We've all had, you know, similar base experiences, and we know what it feels to hurt. So when we can just let people into that, yeah, that's enough. That's enough. Yeah, and there's the the patience and the understanding of how the camera works, and that you know, like Miser says, act, acting is when you're not talking. Mm. That's the real work. It's what it's when we explore your thoughts. First of all, you don't get to take credit for the words. More often than not, you didn't write them. Right. Right. The right. writer wrote them. Right. And you are the you're the vehicle, the conduit <clears throat> to bring them to the story. But what you can take full credit for is your thoughts. Right. What's happening in between the lines, the subtext, what's happening. And when the actor trusts that, you know, your thoughts are interesting. So allow yourself to be thinking through this. And ideally, you're thinking the thoughts of the character. Right. Mm-hmm. So for your students that, that, that uh, lose track every now and then of, of, of the tenets of Miser, Miser says three things will separate the actor. Three kind of rules to live by, standards, that if you check in with these three standards, you'll know that you're doing good work and you'll be doing better work than your competition. So he says, we'll separate you from other actors. First one is intense concentration. You have to have intense concentration. It's easier said than done. Mm-hmm. That's what this gymnast was talking about and why she pulled out. She suddenly realized, her concentration wasn't intense. She was splintered and she's going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. Intense concentration is crucial. Second one is the ability to care deeply about what the character cares about. And that's a real craft. That's when you are in character and you're in the scene, you know the character and the circumstances of the piece so well that in the quiet moments, in the subtext and in the in-between lines, you're thinking the thoughts that the character would be thinking. You're not thinking about whether or not you know, your, your, your wife left you any spaghetti in the fridge. So when you get home, there's something to eat or whether or not you picked up the dry cleaning the next day or, Oh my God, I hope I didn't get a parking ticket. Those are, those are your thoughts, right? You need to be thinking the thoughts of the character. And when you discipline yourself and you know the character well enough in your quiet moments to be caring deeply about what the character cares about. Now you're working the right way. Mm -hmm. And the third one is the willingness to go for the jugular. And that just means get ugly, act without ego, for a man, it usually means being able to melt down vulnerably with a vulnerability. Mm-hmm. For a woman, it often means losing your shit and getting angry. Mm-hmm. But this jugular, what Meisner means by that is just letting it rip and not judging yourself and acting without ego. Mm-hmm. And it might not always look pretty. Matter of fact, oftentimes it looks really ugly and pretty hideous. And that's, and that's where you get the Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's where that's where Charlize Theron does monster. You're right. right. And, and gets the Oscar. So those three things, and if you put those on on a you know on a um, I don't have that piece of paper. Put those on a piece of paper. Put them on your mirror in your dressing room. Intense concentration, ability to care deeply about what the character cares about, willingness to go for the jugular. Check in on those three things. Are you doing those in your work? If you are, your work's probably pretty good. Right on. Yeah. Right on. Well, listen, again, I didn't. I didn't. I don't make this shit up. 
learn from the best. Yeah, but you're a beautiful ambassador of it. I am that. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll take okay. that. So I know you got a role. Life continues. Yep. Uh, what What's next for you? Where can we see you uh, next? And how can we get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, I'd love for your actors to reach out if they want to. If they want to, uh, you know, throw anything uh, at me for for brainstorming. Uh, a couple of Instagrams. Uh, my personal one that I use exclusively for just what films I'm watching, and you can kind of keep up on that. It's very user friendly. That is at Laceman34 Instagram, L A C E M A N 34. And then I do have one for my uh, acting studio at the Lacey Group Acting Studio. Both Instagram. Not a Twitter guy. I have a Facebook page for my for my acting students that if you're in the studio or you wanted to be involved in that, there's a way to get in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then other than that, social media and I are, I keep it pretty simple. Uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I'm in the editing phase right now, the fine cut of Rosebud Lane, which is my second full length feature. Um, and uh, the goal you wrote, directed and produced. Yeah, and produced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and Josh Doherty is among the many uh, great actors in this film. Uh, I've got a list of film festivals that we're targeting, a lot of regional southeastern ones from, you know, Arkansas, Fayetteville, Charlotte, and then finishing up Rosebud Lane. And, uh, yep, teaching my actors and then looking to, to get my next project uh, in development and, and um, on the train tracks. And, you know, I'm always creating some kind of content to, uh, to tell my next story. That's that's just, you know, the next one is always right there for me. So. Yeah. Um, I'm never, never at a lack for something to sit and write or something to, to, you know, ponder. Well, one of the things I love about you most, Johnny, is, is not only that you are a, an actor who works all the freaking time, but you're also a writer who works all the freaking time and you're a director and, and it's, you, you don't, you don't half-ass anything. You go full bore usually with a great cigar in hand, which I love because you know my love of cigars, mm -hmm. um, but you are fully immersed in the art and in the yeah. science and in the craft of what we do. And I just uh, I just love you and I really look up to you. And Thank and, you, brother. Yeah, Mutual. Man. You know, I love you back. Absolutely. And it's been fun to share with you because I know, uh, I, I think I've made an influence on how much you realize you have in you to, to pour more into it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that that fire that fires me up. Yeah, you really have. You really have, and you've given me beautiful opportunities to pour more into it. So yeah, well, uh, that man along those lines, man, that's I'm um, very I'm very grateful. I'm I'm blessed with an embarrassment of riches in terms of talented friends and and actors that I write for and with and then collaborate with. And again, man, that's that's my driving motivation is this this glorious collaboration that we get to do in this work because it's it's endless. I can do it for the rest of my life, and I aim to. So yeah. thank you for having me on. Right on. Ladies and gentlemen, John Lacey. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Josh. We'll see you real soon. You will. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.